Hi everyone, welcome back to Garden on the Moors. We've left Cornwall, <sighs> but don't worry, it's only for the weekend and we are in the equally beautiful Cotswolds Hills. This is an area of limestone grassland behind me and we also have a bit of woodland as well, which we might check out if we get time. But yeah, hope you enjoy the video. Anybody with a kitchen garden might recognise this plant. Um, this is marjoram, basically our wild oregano. It's a beautiful flower and it's absolutely loved by bees when it is in flower. It's got these gorgeous little pink flowers on top here. They've all died over now. But just scrunching up its leaves like that and smell them is delicious. Oh, yeah, lovely. Just below me here is this gorgeous flower called dropwort. This is actually the first time I've ever seen it. I usually see its relative, which is called meadowsweet. Um, I don't know if it smells. Oh, it does have a really nice smell actually. But this is uh, dropwort, which is really similar. They're closely related. And um, <clears throat> they're beautiful, beautiful flowers. And meadowsweet is uh, a lot larger and more, you know, kind of takes over the area. Um, there's a nature reserve back where I'm from originally in Bedfordshire where they're trying to have to control the meadowsweet now because um, it's just so rampant but there we are beautiful beautiful dropwort one of the most important benefits of having native wildflowers in the landscape is that they provide more than just nectar for pollinators which is obviously brilliant but lots of things can do that these native flowers that you can see behind me are providing more than just food for the adults. They're providing food for the young. So if you think about caterpillars for butterflies and moths, a lot of those don't eat nectar. They eat the leaves and some of them even eat the roots and things like that. Um, that's why it's so important if you're trying to create like a wildflower space in your garden to encourage natives rather than just chucking in any old wildflowers. Um, some of these seed mixes have lots of American species in which are lovely and are brilliant for the bees and things like that, but we also need stuff to provide food for the young. So having those um, natives, so, and some of them are, we obviously think of as pests, um, things like uh, carrot root fly is obviously an issue in our gardens um, if we're trying to harvest carrots. Uh, same with cabbage root fly, which is something I get. But in an environment like this, having those different insects eating those roots and things means that no one thing is gonna take over and that creates a nice diversity and we get loads of other different species coming in. This uh, reserve that we're on now is actually really important for a butterfly called the large blue. It's, it was reintroduced here after going extinct in the UK and its, its caterpillars sorry, feed on thyme flowers um, and then they move on to meadow ant species and they go underground where they're kind of protected by the ants but they eat the babies. <laughs> a bit of a weird cycle. Um, and then come up as adults and will feed on these different flowers. So that's why it's so important we have this range of things for the ants to eat, for the young butterflies to eat, and that's just one species. Um, and having those ants also means that we have other species as well. We, we've already heard green woodpeckers uh, yaffling. They have this really loud yaffle call, which you might hear hopefully. Um, we've heard them in the background and other blue butterflies rely on them as well. So there we are, just a little reason why it's so important to have native wildflowers. That's why we get kind of militant on having native wildflowers rather than just any old wildflowers. Oh, now this plant here, I'm sure many of you will recognize. This is yellow rattle, which is hemiparasitic, a lot like our um, lousewort, which you might have seen in our moorland video. This is the yellow rattle, so it's more grassland uh, friend, I suppose, family relative. Um, and what it does is it, like the um, lousewort, is it sticks its root into the grasses and steal some of those nutrients to suppress them. And that's what's helping to create um, this really diverse wildflower rich landscape. We've got some um, pig nut, which we can hopefully see back there, which are the little um, umbellifer flowers. Um, and they've got nice uh, filigree leaves. Uh, they're actually edible um, 
but we won't dig any up to eat them. But they have like a little hazelnut at the at the base of the root to them down there. Um, and we've got all sorts of different orchids and things like that. One thing with it though is that it can obviously take over, so it needs to be used as part of the management, not just relied on entirely. So it needs a good grazing regime. Here they have sheep and ponies, other places you could use cattle, um, but you don't want the yellow to, to take over. It's like I was saying when we have these pests and things, we call them pests, but actually they're doing a just as important role as the yellow rattle. They're killing off some of those more aggressive things by eating them. Um, which then allows other stuff to come through. So having all sorts of different management techniques creates this nice diversity uh, in the landscape, which is brilliant for insects and other wildlife as well after that. If you ever wondered what a wild rose looks like, this is exactly it. This is a, I'm pretty sure this is a dog rose. Um, there are, well, it might be something different. I'd need to check in our book when we get home because um, there's quite a few species. Dog roses are most common and abundant, but you can see it's got this nice climbing habit coming over this hawthorn tree um, and nice open flowers, which have a mm, lovely, soft, proper rosy smell. Absolutely delicious. Um, but yeah, this is our, one of our wild roses. So this is what they look like before all the breeding and uh, doubling up the flowers and all sorts like that. This woodland ride here and you might be able to spot just to the side of me this gorgeous wildflower hopefully you recognize it from my garden and um, because I grow it loads I love growing it this is aquilegia or columbine or people call it granny's bonnet and this is its wild state this is where it naturally belongs this is its wild color size and if we get a little close up you can hopefully see why it's called columbine because it looks like a, a little group of little doves all together with their wings out um, and it gets the name Aquilegia from looking like an eagle's claw um, <clears throat> so you know different ways of looking at it but so yeah here we are it's wild columbine out where it belongs it's brilliant so just across from our Aquilegia over there we've just spotted this gorgeous greater butterfly orchid you can tell it's greater because of the uh, plunia which are really far apart um, and kind of forking away from each other. And they look like little butterflies, I suppose, with the body there, these are its wings, and there's the little antennae on top. These are designed to attract um, like nighttime flying moths, so they'll really come alive in the evening. And that's a good thing to remember if you're creating a space in a garden which you want to sit out of an evening sort of thing is to have lots of bright white flowers because they really shine in the evening that's exactly what this is doing is when it gets to that night time it'll be glowing white reflecting that moonlight as well and it will release a really nice soft scent as well to attract as many moths as possible and we can tell that because behind i don't know if you can see but the nectar um tubes I forgot the proper name for them, but the little nectar tubes are really, really long for a great long proboscis of a moth. So, greater butterfly orchid. Gorgeous, the first orchid we've seen today. I just wanted to stop here and show you guys this gorgeous tree. It's a lovely multi-stemmed tree. This is white beam. So we can tell that because of that gorgeous leaves underneath there, that nice white colour on the leaves. And it also has some fruits as well. Uh, they're not ripe yet, but it has some fruits here too. So this is how we know this is a white beam. It's quite a rare plant, especially we, I mean, I really, really don't see any back at home in Cornwall, um, but at this kind of area, you know, we are near Somerset, Gloucestershire, that kind of uh, area. It's really good for them, uh, going into Wales as well. So yeah, just want to take some time to appreciate this gorgeous white beam.
So another one for our herb garden growers. This is thyme, wild thyme. And uh, this is a really important plant here because this is what the large blue butterflies are laying their eggs on. They lay their eggs on their flowers and then the larvae in their first instar will go through and munch on those before going down into the ants' nests. But it, it smells absolutely wonderful. I just stretched some of the leaves. Oh yeah, reminds me of like roast dinners and stuff like that, gorgeous. Some of you may recognize this plant or at least it might make you remind you of a plant that you might know as a weed called ribwort plantain. This is one of its more delicate relatives called the hoary plantain. Uh, don't worry, it's because it's called, it's because it's hairy. So if we look at its leaves down here, they look just like ribwort plantain, which you might know as a weed. It grows like hell in our garden, but its leaves are really furry. And they're lovely soft to touch. Hopefully you can see that on the camera, but they've got lots of nice soft fur on them. Not like our ribwort plantain, which is smooth and almost waxy. Um, but this flower spike is absolutely gorgeous next to the uh, Quaker grass. We found one of my favourite butterflies, a green hair streak. Hopefully you can just about see that shining emerald in that grass there. Just down in the trees there, we've just seen a male red start, which is a beautiful bird. It's a bit too far away to get a video, but I've got some photos that I can show you. It's this brilliant red, orange red chest, a little black cap, silver back, and the main part about it is it's uh, red base to its tail, but it's a stunning bird, and it loves this kind of open, wooded, wood pasture-y, downland landscape. This is its absolute favorite place to sort of bees. This is where we'd see it in Cornwall as well as up here. And they like to nest in really old hawthorn trees and those sorts of things in the hollows in those trees. And it just shows you we've seen so much uh, bird life here. We've seen green woodpeckers which eat uh, ants. We've seen those red starts, several robin families, uh, thrushes, uh, and there's swallows and house martins flying over. So it just shows you how much life there is because of all of these flowers which are then providing this great diversity for the insects and knocking on to the bird life um, but absolutely brilliant bird to find best bird we've seen today i think we've just come across this gorgeous quite common butterfly but absolutely beautiful nonetheless this is a small tortoise shell so it's got that lovely orange wings black and yellow uh, pattern up top and then blue sapphires all around the base of the wings are absolutely gorgeous these butterflies, as caterpillars, eat stinging nettles, would you believe? So, you know, we all try and get rid of the stinging nettles, blah, 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 blah. But actually, some of our most beautiful butterflies, like this small tortoiseshell, that's what they're feeding on. Same as peacocks and red admirals. So it is worth keeping a few uh, nettles, if you can, to get some of these beautiful little butterflies. Woohoo! There we are. I hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, please give a big thumbs up and subscribe for more and we'll see you again next time. Cheers. Mm -hmm.